Good morning. Welcome everyone to this parallel session on living well with dementia. My name's Dr. Caroline Bellchamber. I'm a professional education lead for Sue Ryder, and it gives me a lot of pleasure to be chairing this session today. And I would just like to say we've got two presentations today, and we'll be looking at how we can support people and their carers living well with dementia. We'll also be focusing on real world practice and looking at recommendations for the planning of services, the delivery and patient and care experience. We will have, after the presentation, we will have a question and answer panel, so please think about your questions as we're going through. And we have someone with a microphone, roving microphone. Lovely, thank you very much. So if you do have a question, just put your hand up and we will make sure the microphone gets to you so that everyone can hear your questions. So on that note, I'd like to give a warm welcome to our first two presenters, who are Dr. Karen Harrison-Denning, who's the Head of Research and Publications, and Caroline Skates, who's the Professional and Practice Development Facilitator for Dementia UK. Thank you. Is, is it still good morning? Yes, only just. Good morning. My name's Karen Harrison-Denning, and I'm going to start off this presentation. And we were asked to come and speak to you today about living well with dementia. So what am I going to look at? I'm going to be looking at what do we mean by living well with dementia, and I also want to consider the, the wider family. It's not just the person that we want to consider living well with dementia, but it's all of those people that are, surround that um, family, that person. I want to look at the aims of Admiral Nursing. I don't know if people here have heard of Admiral Nursing, but I think we're becoming a bit more well-known in the hospice scene, and you, you'll hear a bit more about that later. And we want to outline the model of Admiral Nursing in the hospice model. And I actually just give you some examples of practice and some examples of impact. So when we look at living well with dementia, it's, it's had quite a journey in its own right. And I don't know if any of you ever knew Peter Ashley, who has since uh, died. But he was diagnosed with dementia going back probably about 1999. And I'd organising an event where I was trying to sort of lobby people with dementia and their carers to, to come to an event that we were doing that was looking at patient and public involvement in preparation for the development of the first NICE guidelines. And I approached Peter to speak, and I said that, um, you know, I want him to come and look at this and come and look about uh, at living well with dementia, but also dying well with dementia. And at that point, very much the movement in dementia was, I'm not dying with dementia, I'm living with dementia, which is, which is not wrong. We still want to have a very positive spin on what it is to have dementia. But I think at some point we really do have to consider about dying well with dementia too. And also I just want to refer you to this website, this blog site. Is George with us today? He was intending to come. But he's almost like this sort of newer generation of people with dementia that are actually are embracing the fact that this is a life-limiting condition. And whilst it's important to live well with dementia, but also to die well with dementia. And I'd certainly commend George's blog to you um, as a, a good example of somebody that's prepared to embrace the palliative nature of the disease. And then also, I don't know whether people here are familiar with um, Wendy Mitchell's work. Again, another person with dementia who is quite a strong proponent of what it is to live well with dementia. And actually that dementia doesn't come alone in that it comes with its whole raft of family, carers, uh, neighbours and supporters. But I think that what particularly interests me is taking that a little bit further and, and how effective is any support and care for families living with dementia. And I think that one of the things that um, we pride ourselves in Admiral Nursing is that we don't just work with a person with dementia, we don't just work with the, the family carers, we work with the whole family. So it's very important for us that when we actually deliver care and interventions, it focuses on the family living well with dementia. And I think that we've already heard today that probably the, the new kid on the block, if you like, is frailty. We're all living longer, so we're all actually starting to sort of experience um, diseases that 
previously we may well have died from, and certainly uh, going back to the earlier talk prior to the plenary, I, I was in the carers group, and it was sort of pitching at where we were at within the sort of early 60s and the NHS and, and how we've moved on since. And I think that because we're all living longer, we're all living with different conditions. And Admiral Nursing, we're finding that our population are those with more complex needs, but it's not just the person with dementia whose needs are complex. It's actually the family situation with, within which they, they live. The complexities are increasing manifold. So we're actually seeing family carers that have frailty, family carers that have multimorbidity. And I think that one of the issues about living well with dementia is not just to ensure that the emotional and psychological resilience and living well with dementia, but also we have a duty to enable people with dementia and their families to physically live well with dementia. And I think we do need to see a lot more about how we can enable spousal carers particularly to become more physically resilient in their caring role. Yes, we would like to see more carer services. Yes, we, we think that, that, that families affected by dementia should have access to all of the, the range of services that other terminal conditions do. But the reality is they don't. And if we're see, to see that these families experiencing more and more hours of caring, then we have a right and a duty to expect that those people are exposed to more resilient care. What I'd like to do now is hand over to Caroline, who's going to talk a little bit more about the model of Admiral Nursing. Thanks, Karen. Good morning. And Karen mentioned a blog by George Rook, who I think has just entered the room. Give us a wave, George. Thank you for making it this morning. Um, so what we wanted to talk to you about now is around the case management Admiral Nursing can offer um, for people living with dementia. Um, and as we know, there are increasing numbers um, of people affected by dementia now, the, the, the number of these 850,000 at the moment in the UK and rising um, with an estimate of over a million by 2025. Um, and we know that also with the all parliamentary group, uh, there was a, a great document called Dementia Ready Travels Alone and that looked at how seven out of 10 people living with dementia also had other long-term commissions and comorbidities. Um, and as Karen's already mentioned, the family carers um, that we're seeing are often much older um, and they also have their own physical, psychological and social needs that also we need to be ensuring that we support. Um, and above all as well, when we're thinking about services, we want to make sure we've got best value for money, we've got res uh, scarce resources um, and we've got a case study that we can demonstrate in a little while to show you how Apple nursing and case management can actually support that. Um, supporting best practice in general as well, the, the model of um, Admiral Nursing looks at not only working with family carers, but supporting best practice. And that's a great way of being able to enable other healthcare professionals to seek support from their local Admiral Nurses if they have one, and being able to share. We talked, um, Tracy talked earlier on about that collaboration and sharing of services. And certainly we see Admiral Nursing as a model that can absolutely complement um, hospice care. Okay, so what do our Admiral Nurses actually do? For those of you that aren't familiar with um, Admiral Nursing, um, it depends on where the setting is, so where the, um, the Admiral Nurse is based, what role they have, what their collaboration with us is. But essentially all of them are looking at family and relationship-centred care. Um, we recognise that the specialist assessment and evidence-based interventions they can offer are absolutely really, really important. And it's alongside supporting the carer and making sure that the carer is looked after and supported, which then enable them to continue caring for the person with dementia. In terms of the aims of Admiral Nursing, looking at actually how we um, improve wellbeing for carers, enhance family support, and we're getting a lot of evidence out there at the moment with um, carer burden and stress and the impact of caring, and, and particularly for people that are older carers, you know, looking after somebody for seven days a week, 24 hours a day, and the impact that has on their own health needs as well. And we're beginning to see now how the aims of Admiral Nursing are able to not only help the person with dementia and their family, but also enhance 
the work that they're doing with their colleagues and in the wider context in, in, in order to sort of spread the knowledge and the expertise that they have. And when I think about education as well, the educational role um, of the Admiral Nurse, it's not just about education in teaching sessions and with their colleagues, but also carers groups for families. So it might be small carers groups, it might be post-diagnostic um, carers groups. But again, that's another way of being able to make sure that people have the support that they need. Next slide to triangle. We love triangles in nursing, don't we? And here's another triangle. Uh, you'll be familiar with the Department of Health Nursing Strategy 2016 um, that looked at this, the tiered support for dementia care. And Admiral Nurses um, were up there on tier three looking at the complexity levels. And that was alongside specialist palliative care nurses and other dementia specialist nurses. We also really see Admiral Nursing as influencing at tier one and tier two, so tier A and tier B, um, by using that case management approach um, and making sure that actually that each person, each level, has the support they need to be able to deliver appropriate um, and well-timed dementia care. I apologise this has been a bit of a busy slide, but it's um, a really important one, I think. So um, you'll be familiar with the NHS England Well, pa well Pathway for Dementia Care. And what we asked our Admiral Nurses to do was to map their interventions and their care to that well pathway. So as um, Caroline said, the slides will be available afterwards. It's a little bit busy, but it just demonstrates, I think, how Admiral Nursing can fit in right from preventing well, because it can be sometimes that the carers have got their own concerns around their own cognitive function, actually what support they might need right through to the person being diagnosed with dementia, how that support is then given, thinking about actually managing with interventions, actually what we can do to support them to live as well as they can, um, and then right through until end of life and dying well with dementia. And this is my favourite slide. So overall we have 260 Admiral nurses in the UK. They go across all settings, so we have Admiral nurses in the community, in acute care in hospitals, in care homes, and now a growing number of nurses in hospices. So the little blue blobs we've got there and the list of nurses alongside, list of services, are the 15 posts that we've currently got in hospices in the UK, um, and there are others in negotiation. Um, we kind of thought, saw a really big change, a really big growth um, post the hospice enabled care um, document by Hospice UK in 2015 and we saw a really big spike in actually hospices becoming really interested in actually how an Admiral nurse could enhance their work um, with people with dementia and what that would look like. Um, I think also we have a um, Hospice UK and Dementia UK joint community of practice which again I think has raised interest in actually how the two can work together well. We do have a stand downstairs um, we're very happy to talk to anyone today about that. And there are also quite a few posters downstairs in the exhibition hall um, demonstrating the work of Admiral Nursing. Um, but essentially, we know that dementia is a life-limiting illness, and we want to make sure that people have the same access to good specialist palliative care services as any other illness. Back to Karen. I just want to introduce you to uh, an EAPC white paper. You may already be familiar with it. But it was actually an, an exercise undertaken by colleagues in Holland who, who managed it, but was across experts across um, many countries. And it actually looked at what constitutes good palliative and end-of-life care in dementia. And it, it sort of reduced that to 11 domains. And this was using a Delphi process to, to sort of get a consensus agreement. And under those 11 domains are 57 recommendations. And why, you may ask, so have I got this up? But I think that one of the interesting things was that we benchmarked the Admiral Nurse Palliative Care approach against the recommendations. And perhaps unsurprisingly, and, and it would be expected, we perform well against all of those recommendations. But one of the problems is that whilst we're seeing a growth in the hospice model of Admiral Nursing, the palliative and end-of-life care nature of dementia is not being seen uh, in many other commissioning settings. And the fragment, the journey of people with dementia is being fragmented more and more because people are commissioning dementia specialist services for different parts of that pathway. And we really do need to embrace the whole dementia pathway in a palliative approach. So we've got this coming out in publication shortly and certainly we can give you the reference for that. But I think that living and dying well with dementia, there are certain barriers to palliative care. And I think the main barrier is enabling the person with dementia to both live well and die well, as I mentioned earlier. And I think that 
If we're to embrace the palliative approach in, and, and apply it to dementia care, I, I almost think that it's, it's a, a, a sort of a combination made in heaven. And, and often going back years when I had working with colleagues in palliative care, I was just saying if we could just try to take what palliative care brings to dementia into a bottle and dip it out, drop it out into different dementia services or care homes. And it's so encouraging to see now the hospice movement actually embracing dementia care. But I think that where the case ma management model does exist, there are still issues, and, and I think that we need to be talking to commissioners to ensure that they actually embrace, whether it's in, in the NHS or whether it's in private sector, voluntary sector, that we do have to make sure that the journey of dementia r remains as intact as possible when we think about services. And when I look at what hospice dasmal nurses do, and I reflect back at what Caroline was saying on, well, what do admiral nurses do generally? We always have seemed to embrace a palliative approach to, to care. I mean, dementia is a life-limiting condition, so albeit that your diagnosis might be gained 15, 20 years before you die, it nevertheless is going to affect your life and it's going to shorten it. And certainly we're seeing now people with dementia dying um, probably uh, have a shorter lifespan than many people with cancer. So we do need to really embrace that. One of the things that we do come up against, and, and I'm sure hospices are the same, is what evidence do you have for your outcomes, for your impact? Why should the NHS, why should commissioners invest in you? So we're, we're constantly having to play catch up in admiral nursing, as, as are lots of other services. We don't think we're unique, we don't think we're special. So we actually um, de developed a program called Getting Ev Evidence into Admiral Nursing Services. So we can actually demonstrate what outcomes that the service can bring, not just to people. So it's not just about improving quality of life, and, and that's obviously one of the domains that we measure, but also what, what, what does that mean in terms of symptom management towards the end of life? And as NICE is much more interested now is, health economics, how can we sort of justify some health economics to that? So we're, we're just sort of slowly but surely exploring our measurement systems with hospice, what you already collect, but then what is much more relevant to dementia care. And certainly with things like IPOS-DEM, we're, we're now actually seeing that some of the measures that you're already using are now being validated within the dementia field. Now, this algorithm was featured in the EAPC white paper, and I, I think it's quite interesting, and I just want to um, show you why. Because in a way, um, the diagnosis of dementia has often overshadowed any other condition. So if there's any symptoms of distress, traditionally they've always been seen as a feature of the dementia rather than for whatever underlying condition that there is. And there's been an awful lot of research over the last five years about the symptom burden in dementia, physical symptoms. But I think that in a way, some people sort of say, well, when do you stop living with dementia and when do you start dying with dementia? And I think that that's one of the big uncertainties and where we have to really look at an individual situation and an individual person. But I think that this is quite useful and I want to just talk you through a case study. Obviously, it's anonymised, but it is a case study uh, in, in fact. And here we had a, a lady with moderate dementia living alone at home, uh, supported by her daughter, who lived fairly close, but had her own life, her own working life, her own family. And mum was also diagnosed with Crohn's disease. Now, what, with, what had happened before the admiral nurse got involved was that each flare-up of her Crohn's disease was treated as a separate incident. So each time she became very unwell, nobody recognised that it actually was um, a, a flare-up of her Crohn's disease. It was diagnostically overshadowed and seen as part of her dementia, admitted to acute hospital, treated, and out she came again. Um, caused a lot of distress, both for the family and for, the, for Mrs Schultz herself. And it was expensive care, because... Did she need to go into acute hospital? So if you looked at that previous algorithm, where would she be? You'd, she's got moderate dementia, OK? But you could say that if, if she was having all of these repeated admissions, and, and we were talking about eight admissions in six months, then is that indicative that this person's nearing the end of their life? Because some people would actually see that. And think about moving the goals of care to comfort care. So. Is that where she was? Should we that now start looking at maximising comfort? Well, what happened was the Admiral Nurse actually 
translated what Mrs. Schultz was uh, displaying in light of the diagnosis of dementia and in light of her Crohn's disease flare-ups and actually managed to bring uh, the care and treatment, to coordinate the care and treatment of Mrs. Schultz's Crohn's dis disease to the point where the family became much more aware of, of her uh, symptoms of relapse, that they were able to intervene much quicker, that they in actual fact were um, validated to administer the medication to, to maintain her well-being. And in this, the uh, six months following that, there were no hospitals admission. So I would arguably say that, okay, yes, moderate dementia, but there's no reason why we couldn't still actively treat and support her multimorbid condition, her Crohn's disease, to enable her to live well with both her dementia and her Crohn's disease. So in, indeed, it shifted our focus of attention to actually sh we, we should still be maintaining function, even though this lady was in a moderate stages of dementia. But one of the interesting things perhaps to commissioners was the cost effectiveness of that. Now, this is just one case, and, and it, you, you sort of predict what the costs were to treatment prior to the intervention of the admiral nursing. And then looking at that, that same service utility for the equal period thereafter, and what difference did that make? And in effect, for that one person, there were over £11,000 saving simply by re, um, preventing her admission to acute hospital. And that this is actually aside any measurement of quality of life and actually helping Mrs. Schultz and her daughter to live well with dementia. I'm going to hand you back to Caroline. Thank you. So this is um, one example of um, a hospice nurse evaluation that we did. Um, there's an amazing Apple nurse called George Ord in, in the Earl of Batten Hospice in the Isle of Wight. And we evaluated her service after a year and were able to say that she managed 43 uh, families with quite complex needs. Um, she trained 237 staff and 91% of people with dementia actually died in their preferred place of care. Um, but I think what, when you talk to, to Jill about actually her experience and actually working um, as an Apple nurse for the first time in that hospice, what she was saying actually, it's, not, it's about that confidence um, of the staff caring and that, that culture shift um, that's a little bit unmeasurable, I guess. Um, but what was really apparent to her was actually how the work that she'd done was able to really move um, on uh, dementia care in, in her hospice. And the service evaluation team that we have at Dementia UK were able to support Jill in that process to, to, to provide her evaluation, which um, is a, a great um, way to demonstrate what she did for that year. Um, just to try and bring things to the conclusion, I know we're running out of time already. Um, this is really around um, how we um, gain evidence. So the, the beginning, the outcomes for families um, affected by dementia. Um, we know that we can improve um, how, how people live with dementia. Lower levels of depression, anxiety in family carers, better access to information and support, and higher satisfaction for people that are being carers. And that's around the case management work and of nurse actually working with families. But also around supporting best practice, so improving outcomes for people with dementia by making sure they've got good access to support, to reduce GP call-outs, reduce inappropriate hospital admissions, all the things that's demonstrated in Karen's case study, really, um, to show that actually how we can enable people to live as well as they can with dementia. On our website, we've got lots of resources. And we've also, the next um, slide I'm going to show you is actually a very short three-minute animation film um, we'd like to share with you. We've talked a lot about how Admiral Nursing focuses on family-centred, relationship-centred care. Um, and although we've talked a lot about living well with dementia, making sure people have the best quality of life, there's also times when the Admiral Nurse acts as a, a, a conduit, if you like, in a, in a way to actually be that connection between the person with dementia and their carer should those connections get more difficult and those relationships begin to struggle. Um, it's only three minutes long. I'm going to click next. I'm not sure it's going to come on straight away, but it is quite a powerful video. Um, it is available, like I said, on the website, but we think it's a really good way of demonstrating what Admiral Nurses can do. I probably need to click again.
Thank you for sharing that. I'd now like to warmly welcome Carrie Harrison, Patient Service Director from the Heart of Kent Hospice. Thank you to Hospice UK for inviting me to speak today. I'm going to tell you about the dementia service we run at Heart of Kent Hospice. I will explain our decision making as a story. We all know the dementia statistics and how prevalence is only set to rise in the future. Caroline spoke about some numbers. It is a story because it's absolutely patient driven. I will tell you how the story developed um, how the service has developed into the service we have today, what the challenges have been along the way, looking at key points and question, would we do anything differently if we were starting again? Heart of Kent Hospice is just outside Maidstone, the county town of Kent, and like many hospices, we offer inpatient, community, family support, living well, bereavement, educational services and dementia service. We feel very strongly that our services are not all about a building. We are one of two hospices in West Kent CCG with a pa patient population of 220,000. Last year, we cared for over 1,400 patients and currently we have 716 patients on our caseload, and that includes 293 who have dementia. In 2015, just as I joined the hospice, a grant had been awarded, and I was asked to set up a dementia service. The one dementia clinical nurse specialist was appointed and there were six dementia patients on the caseload. It became very quickly clear that we were getting late referrals, nearing patients nearing the end of their lives, often as late as 24, 48 hours prior to death. This told us that we needed to educate referrers, GPs, district nurses, and care home staff, letting them know that they could refer patients earlier in their disease trajectory. The Dementia CNS attended Gold Standard Framework meetings and promoted the service to all external healthcare professionals. But still referrals came late. 
with no time to build meaningful relationships and we were unable to achieve any advanced care planning. We thought about the barriers to early referrals. Was it lack of knowledge on that the service existed, healthcare professionals uncomfortable about referring to a hospice, having to instigate those difficult conversations, lack of time to explain, even if they understood, what the hospice role could be in supporting dementia patients and carers, and fear from patients and carers. Does this mean I'm dying? I do not need a hospice yet. In the first six months, the number of patients referred slowly grew. The clinical nurse specialist, Tracy, remained frustrated that she could not achieve good advanced care planning, which she knew could improve outcomes later as the patient's illness progressed. It should be noted at this point that personal experience was a key driver for this nurse to support patients to achieve future planning wherever possible. We explored the acute mental health services locally to us and mapped a patient through referral from diagnosis and acute aftercare before they were referred back to their GP for follow-up. Our local trust offers a Living Well with Dementia course. Then the patient is referred back to primary care. We approached the trust, the memory team clinic, the memory clinic team rather, and told them about our plans to get to meet dementia patients and their carers soon after diagnosis. They invited our dementia nurse to the memory clinic appointments by way of an initial introduction to the hospice service. You can imagine that for some patients that was quite difficult, but it seemed to work. This was very different to the general hospice model of care the last year of life. We ran focus groups for patients and carers that we met through the memory clinic, and a common theme from the findings was that after the Living Well and Dementia course had finished, they felt quite abandoned, they, un they had unanswered questions, and they were worried about the future. They knew they could go to their GP and often didn't want to bother them. They vaguely knew they would have an annual review with them. Patients and carers told us that they felt overwhelmed by the vast array of contact numbers they had been given, all sorts of agencies, admiral nurses, local groups, who should they contact and when. Comments include, you can claim benefits, but what and how? So much information to take in when it's all too raw and new. We found that once patients but especially the carers, had a single point of contact, the hospice, which has a 24-hour phone line for advice and support, that this was often enough to allay fears. And with the support of various agencies in the community, often patients went for periods of time managing fairly well and then hitting a crisis when the hospice could step in and signpost to the most appropriate source of support. The hospice has the added benefit of having the expertise with a palliative care approach, which again, um, my colleagues picked up on earlier. Having that palliative care approach, if, there, if, if a patient hits um, a crisis or becomes less well, we can look at things like, is this something reversible, like an infection, or is it disease progression? Are they unfortunately entering a new phase of their illness? At this point, the organization made a conscious decision to take dementia referrals from diagnosis. Were we ready for the tsunami? Was this a risk? A second dementia nurse was employed, and at this point, we had to work with our trustees to help them understand that dementia care should become a core hospice service because it is a terminal illness. It was a challenge moving the trustees, getting them to understand that we wanted to provide an equitable service for patients, whatever their disease, that hospice care for dementia should be on the same platform as motor neurone disease or multiple sclerosis. We also felt 
that the service would, fu would future-proof the organisation, knowing that dementia and frailty are going to be big concerns for the years to come. We engaged with the trustees through one-to-one -one discussions, providing education and information, but most importantly, showcasing the services. I would challenge anyone to attend our Dementia Cafe and witness 50 to 60 patients and carers. I would challenge them not to see the impact that that two hours has and not to feel humbled and recognise it as a much needed service. I know from a colleague at another hospice that a different approach was taken using a grant for dementia. Same grant, I think. They initially looked at training teams within the organisation to be dementia friendly. They employed a clinician to do this, but their board were keen only to focus on education and not a clinical caseload, which left the clinician feeling frustrated and actually questioning were there missed opportunities and conflict around disease-specific specialism and the core hospice services. Educating others is a key part of our dementia service. In October this year, during Hospice Care Week, we held a very successful conference called Looking Beyond Dementia to the Person Inside, a hospice care approach. There are currently 3,500 patients in West Kent CCG area with a confirmed dementia diagnosis and likely many more not known to their mental health services. 293 patients is a huge caseload for two nurses. However, it's managed after initial assessment and planning by taking a dipping in and out as the patient needs this approach, very much it's as much or as little as you want. So patients can maintain and carers can maintain that control. We don't discharge patients because, again, patients and carers said they feel abandoned. We have an open access caseload. As our caseload grew, we found that patients were achieving care planning and conversations were being had and they were getting some sort of plan recorded. In June this year, a snapshot audit showed 60% of our dementia caseload had an advanced care plan. 55% had preferences and wishes recorded. That's slightly different to advanced care planning. It might just be how many sugars they like in their tea or what time they like their breakfast. 90% had a do not resuscitate form and we aim for 100% of patients having a this is me and a missing persons documentation recorded. In October 2016, we launched a monthly Saturday morning dementia cafe, again breaking the referral boundaries, saying that you do not need to be known or already referred to the hospice to attend. Anyone with or caring for someone with dementia was welcome. We either took attendance at the cafe as a referral or we signposted to the appropriate agencies. In September, as I said, we had over 60 people at the cafe. We identified from the people attending the cafe that they needed something more than just one morning a week, a month, sorry. I'm very passionate that as an organisation, we do not duplicate services that already exist. For example, daycare, age UK, and similar organisations are available. But that as a hospice, we add value and therapeutic benefit to everything that we offer. So Making Memories was born. This is an eight-week programme where patients and carers attend the hospice outpatient centre for the day together. Together is the key. Making Memories is not a respite daycare setting. The day is run by our dementia nurses with the support of 20 dementia-trained volunteers. Activities include creating memory boxes, cognitive stimulation, re reminiscence, singing, and much, much more. During the day, carers are taken into a room close by for an hour or so to give them the opportunity for being together. Peer support, I truly believe peer support cannot be underestimated 
The team take a multidisciplinary approach and they also facilitate education as part of this group, which is called In It Together. I think we all know that carer, carers groups often don't work because carers can't leave the ones they're caring for. So by doing it on the same day and bringing them together, it really has worked. Education topics include managing challenging behaviour, diet and nutrition, understanding what might feel like a crisis, or what to expect of their, as their loved ones deteriorate. The hospice social worker also offers a pre-bereavement support through this group, In It Together. The group is funded by a grant from the Masonic Charitable Foundation. We are currently applying for the copyright for the Making Memories name. So no pinching it. Another innovative part of the dementia service is Anna Chaplaincy. Anna Chaplaincy is an ecumenical community-based chaplaincy to older people, named after the faithful older woman, Anna, who the Bible tells us recognised the baby Jesus as the fulfilment of God's promises. Working with our local churches, we believe we are the first hospice to host Anna Chaplains and Anna Friends to support dementia patients and their carers with their spiritual needs. Heart of Kent Hospice has also embraced the Namaste approach to dementia care and delivers training to care homes. Namaste is from the Hindu to honour the spirit within. The core elements are the presence of others, comfort and pain management, the five senses, sight, touch, taste, hearing and smell, creating an atmosphere and hydration and nutrition. There is a Namaste research um, uh, program in process at the moment. Professor Catherine Froggett and others at Lancaster University, they're looking at the Namaste care intervention to improve the quality of dying for people with advanced dementia living in care homes a realist review and feasibility study for a, a cluster randomised controlled trial. Following training, three care homes in our area, they've carried out a pilot implementing the Namaste approach and they shared their findings with us at the dementia conference that we held in October. They held an average of two to three sessions each week 60% of patients gained weight, 20% maintained their weight, and 20% lost weight. There was a reported noticeable increase in diet and fluid intake at the time of the sessions. No reported urinary tract infections in the groups over the three months, and one patient in the group had previously had recurrent urinary tract infections. No reported new pressure ulcers in the group over three months. All of the reviews indicated improved sleep patterns, especially on the days that the sessions were delivered. Without exception, the reviews indicated a reduction in anxiety, with many of the patients visibly more relaxed and settled throughout the sessions and following the sessions. So to recap, the five key points to take away from my story, early referral, one-to-one -one CNS assessment and plan, dementia cafe, making memories, education and end-of-life care, pre- and post-bereavement support. There have been frustrations along the way. All clinical commissioning groups are different and individual and all hospices are funded differently. One of the biggest frustrations has been working with our CCG and the Acute Mental Health Trust to identify how our service sits within their future plans and, and to secure funding for our dementia service. My personal advice would be to talk, talk and talk again to the CCG, to the commissioners and to the acute trusts. And then I'd ask the question, would we do it all again? Yes, we would. 
I'd like to just leave you today with a poem written by Nicola, one of the nursing home carers. Soothing music, a gentle smile, let me hold your hand a while. Watch the bubbles fill the air, feel the presence everywhere. One to one, just you and me. Welcome, dear, to Namaste. Scented oils smell so sweet, massaged into your hands and feet. Looking into your eyes so deep, watching you as you drift off to sleep. For in this moment you feel no pain, it's like a different world again, free again. Let me take your troubles, dear, and make them all disappear. Time to wake and have some fun, drinks and treats for everyone. Music louder, instruments to play, another successful Namaste Day. Thank you. So some really good talks and lots of key messages. Is there any or are there any questions from the floor? If you put your hand up. Oh, lovely. Thank you. <laughs> um, there are there are twelve in uh, twelve, so six patients, six carers in each group, and it's an eight-week um, program. Well, I think as a hospice, when I, I mentioned, I linked it to or likened it to sort of MND and multiple sclerosis. We know that their um, disease trajectory is very different. Any of the the long-term chronic conditions, disease trajectories are very different to the cancer. Um, journeys, aren't they? So we already do take um, earlier referrals um, for, for those, but no, I've not been particularly challenged um, over taking dementia patients at diagnosis. Can I just come back? Yes, please do. Can I just come back on that? I think that um, one, one of the issues is that I think very few people will challenge you because there's a, a dearth of services available for people with dementia. And I think that um, when dementia was actually seen for what it is, and that is brain disease, and no longer was um, seen as re being under the umbrella of mental health services. Um, the only sort of um, care that they get largely is diagnosis. So, but often at the point after that diagnosis, they're left. Unless they're lucky enough to be prescribed a, an anticholinesterase inhibitor, they might get some follow-up from a memory service. But often they're shown the back door and say, come back when there's a crisis. And I think that what happens is that if any services are available for pe families affected by dementia at any point of the trajectory, they're very welcome, whoever provides them. And I think that one of, one of the issues probably for hospice is that Palliative care is still seen as synonymous with cancer care. So it might be that, that, that's, that that's the hurdle for families affected by dementia in willingly accessing hospice. But I, I, I would absolutely welcome hospice to be involved in dementia care um, because I think that we have the better opportunity for consistency and continuity. Just come back as well. I think it, I think you're exactly right. I think it, it's not just about um, patients being con and carers being concerned about being referred to a, a hospice because they think it's just cancer care. They also think it's just about the last few weeks of life, and actually, it really isn't. Um, and I think you know the title of this session was "Living Well with Dementia," and I think that's what it says on the tin. You know, we're able to support people to live well with their dementia. Um, but also taking that really important palliative care approach. Hi, um, I'm Nicole, I'm one of the clinical nurse specialists from St Helena, which is in Colchester. Um, we don't actually have access to Admiral nurses, um, but from my point of view, obviously as a clinical nurse specialist, it's really important and we're seeing a lot more dementia patients. Just wondering how we would actually access Admiral care nurse from, I can see Farley is probably the nearest to us. Or how do I refer? That's <laughs> so a very good question. It, uh, that's a really good question. Um, Essex is up and coming in terms of upper nursing. So we have two nurses based at Colchester Hospital, one at Broomfield and one at Farley. 
Um, the Broomfield notice is a very new one, it's, it's, so it's just, just new into post. And there are um, two vacancies at the moment for community nurses in Essex. So it is a patch that is growing. However, we know that we haven't got Admiral nurses in every place and we'd love to have many more of them. Um, for those people that can't access um, Admiral nurses, what we do have is a national um, Admiral nurse helpline, which is a seven day a week helpline. The details are on our website and that's open to any carer um, person with dementia or, or professional that just wants a bit of advice and support. So although it, it isn't meant to fill a gap, because obviously we would love to have more nurses on the ground, um, but it is something that people can, can use as a resource. So if you do have any questions, if you are looking after people and you, you, you just want to talk something through, then the helpline would be a good resource for you. Uh, can, I, can I just ask Kerry about the thinking behind the Making Memories registration process? What's, what are the benefits? It looks to me like a silo. Um, well, when, when patients came to the Dementia Cafe, um, we, we recognised, having worked with them and also done the focus groups, we recognised that there, there was day care, there was day respite care out in the community. Um, but we wanted to combine something that was um, educational, peer support, um, and something for the carers as well, so they just didn't drop their loved ones off. And, and we, we know how valuable the respite side of it is, but actually um, bringing them together um, in a safe environment um, has, has been really, really beneficial. And just the peer support that they get when they go off into the carers group, um, it is just an eight-week program. We are now finding that at the end of that eight weeks, people are saying to us, what next? Um, they then come back and, and continue to come to the Dementia Cafe. They also come to our regular drop-in and living well groups that, um, that the hospice run. So they're accessing us in, in different ways. Um, but it's not siloed. It, it works very well, um, but it's just trying to meet the the needs of so many really and they're referred in through so although people don't need a referral to come to the dementia cafe um, the patients that come to making memories program are known to us through the, the cafe or through the general caseload and and are referred into that group decision to register it just the name really um, just to be able to um, protect protect the name uh, so that we can roll it out. Sorry? Yeah, so we can roll it out to other hospices, roll the model out. Oh, lovely, thank you. Hi, um, uh, my name's George Rook. Um, uh, I chair the Three Nations Dementia Working Group and our local Dementia Action Alliance. Um, and I also work with Dementia UK to promote Admiral Nurses who I think are fantastic. What I've heard this morning is wonderful. And speaking on behalf of people living with dementia, we would love more of this. Um, it's been said just now that, that services are very patchy, they're very sparse, um, and it tends to be a medical model. We need the other stuff that you do, which, which you know, the, the joining up of services for us um, the prov providing support for the family, um, whether they are biological family or neighbours, whatever, whoever. Um, what I wanted to ask was, uh, and I may have missed this earlier on, but is there a sort of um, general decision to, to, to move towards having all hospices hosting Admiral Nurses and moving into providing long-term palliative care for people living with dementia? I think that w one of the things that um, I might need to sort of establish is that because dementia I consider is homeless, um, since it sort of failed, you know, it sort of got moved out of secondary mental health services, it's, it's been homeless. And there's no one service or organisation that owns dementia. So, in a way, Dementia UK has, has played a very opportunistic sort of approach to it. And we're, we're almost very, very grateful to any organisation that wishes, wishes to host an Admiral Nurse. But I don't think that has sustainability long term. 
And I think that we should actually look at um, care services that are embracing of all conditions, really, and all ethnic minorities and cultures. And I think that um, I, you were mentioning about silos, and a lot of families affected by dementia don't want to be lumped into a dementia service, but they, they just want to be seen to be people still. I, I was listening to a woman uh, speak about she had dementia, and she said that the day before she was diagnosed, she had a, a, a love of roses. She, she just used to go into her garden, and she would prune and tend her roses. After the diagnosis, then she, it was expected that we find the evidence for horticultural therapy to be of benefit to somebody that has dementia. And I think that that sort of stance really highlights how 30% of us in this room will have dementia at some point. Um, we are people with dementia. Dementia, People with dementia are us. And as, so I think that we just need to make sure that they have equitable access to whatever services anybody else should enjoy. And if that's access to hospice care, if they so chose, if, if it's access to um, horticultural therapy, it shouldn't need researching. Do, do you see what I mean? It, we, patients with dementia are people. They're people. Thank you. Sorry, that seems to have silenced <laughs> <everyone>. <laughs> Any other questions you'd like to bring to the panel? Hello, there. Thank you. I'm Kerry Barham. I'm nurse consultant with St Barnabas Hospice and really, really excited that we're just about to recruit um, for the whole county a team of Admiral nurses. Um, it's a real innovation. It's just really to make a comment about having, how we look differently and innovatively at funding Admiral nurses. Um, and I think there's a real opportunity to look at... Um, this through a public health approach so that we can really, it's about living well. And I, I sit here as well as somebody, my mum was, um, my mum's only 63 when she was diagnosed with dementia. And I absolutely have a lived experience of that um, uh, very medical model and absolutely the hospice approach because it is without barriers. It's based on needs, not on diagnosis. It, it's a really good fit. So, um, I think that's the bit I would say. I think there's time we need to start looking at how we tap into different funding resources because it doesn't sit naturally under health. Um, and very much health ha tends to have a, um, a view where we go and fix stuff, actually, rather than working with people for person-centred outcomes. Um, so, like I say, I'm really looking forward to working with you much more closely and using the skills and knowledge that you can bring because I think that will benefit everybody regardless of their diagnosis. I think that the whole integration agenda is quite interesting. Um, we have evaluated lots of different Admiral Nursing services along the way, and we uh, looked at a year evaluation of a, a community, integrated community model in east of England. And it was jointly commissioned for the pilot by health and social care, and indeed there was another voluntary organisation involved. And the evaluation showed in terms of health economics, that there was nearly half a million pounds savings to the local health and social care community. But because it wasn't easy to pick, unpick who the savings were for, um, there was a, a, a bit of sort of um, disagreement as to whether the main benefits were to health or whether they were to social care. And, and indeed, I think that part of it features on a a BBC documentary where the public actually voted on where money should be spent. So the pilot was extended for another year and then another year and the same savings were made to health and social care. But because it was a bit unclear as to who achieved the main savings, nobody wanted to continue commissioning it in an integrated way. We have to move towards pooled budgets wherever they come from. Um, and not continue to rely on the, the personal pocket of family carers who actually are meeting most of the budget at the moment. And I think from a hospice perspective, you know, we've had to um, really, really push and fight to get our voice heard at the um, commissioning CCG level um, and where we are in Kent with the STP, um, creating clusters and MDT clusters and actually working with them to see where our service sits and how we can integrate our service with the, the commissioning work they're doing with the Mental Health Trust 
um, and social care. So I think it's really important, important that hospices have a voice at those um, tables as well. All right, we've got a couple more minutes if you'd like to ask a few more questions. Thank you. Uh, David Scott Rouse from St Wilfrid's Hospice in Eastbourne. Um, I was just interested to pick up on something that Kerry mentioned a little while ago about the, the challenge, the barrier for, for people wanting to be referred to the hospice because they think it's just end of life. Um, and I just wondered whether with two years experience that is changing, not just for people with dementia and their, their carers, but also more generally. Are you managing to get a, a different perception um, both with uh, the public, but also with referrers, most importantly, because, it, of course, it's not just dementia patients that have that view. No, exactly. Um, and I think you're exactly right. My, um, my CEO, who's in the audience today, we were at um, an STP um, workforce conference, and Sarah gave a talk on a, a myth-busting talk, and it was to a room full of healthcare professionals, 250 or so, and actually the... Um, the, the, the comments it got that from the healthcare professionals that actually they didn't fully understand what a hospice did. So I think if fundamentally, if the healthcare professionals and the referrers don't fully get it, you know, we've got a, a job to do with the community and it's a huge part of our strategic aims going forward is to actually make sure that over the next few years that the public, our, especially our local community, but the, the wider public do understand what we do. So, yeah. Definitely. Thank you. Kay Green from Marianne Evans in Nuneaton. I was just really interested, Kerry, you said you appointed a CNS. Um, having managed over the decades a lots of teams of CNSs, did you go for a CNS with a mental health background and experience in dementia? Or did you go for a CNS with a palliative background? What, what was your specification? Um, we, we went for a, a CNS with a palliative background, but she had done... Um, the European Certificate of Dementia, Specialist Dementia Care, um, and she had um, a huge personal um, insight into dementia care, and then that fueled her her study and her wish. So we have got the um, both our CNSs have got a palliative care background. I think the interesting thing that um, we're looking forward to is working with the um, SDP and the clusters because. They're integrated. They're obviously coming from the mental health um, background, so I think there'll be a mixture, and I think that would be really, really helpful. Follow up on that for Admiral nurses in based in hospices at the moment. We've got a mixture, so we've got some RMNs with an interest in palliative care and some RGN palliative care nurses with an interest in dementia. So it's a, a, a mixed model for Admiral nursing at the moment. Can we give a big, warm thank you for our speakers? Thank you. Really transforming palliative care and looking at new ways of working.